Like all things 9-11, this video is going to stir a lot of emotions in a lot of people, and it's going to be controversial no matter how well I present what I have to say. And so, with this in mind, I want to begin with a few caveats. The first is that the purpose of this video isn't to debunk all 9-11 conspiracies, but rather it's to debunk just a few of what I personally found to be the most compelling arguments before doing adequate research. The second is that I'm going to assume that you accept independent reputable sources, and that you don't think that just about every major establishment is part of the conspiracy. If you think that the planes were holograms, for example, then just leave a dislike, an angry comment, and move along. The third is that there's no way that I can sufficiently cover every aspect of every argument within this short video, and so please just bear that in mind. The fourth is that no matter which conspiracy arguments I take on, in the mind of a conspiracy theorist, they're going to be the wrong ones, and I'm going to be accused of not taking on the real arguments. Well, in preemptive response to this, just let me know which arguments you'd like me to take on within a second video. But provide resources, and I mean real resources. Not documentaries or conspiracy blogs, but the resources that these documentaries and conspiracy blogs reference. And my final caveat is that my sincere condolences go out to everyone affected by the events of 9-11. Researching for this video has been emotional, and I'm deeply sorry for your loss. So, with all of that said, let's get on with it. This is 9-9-11 Conspiracy Arguments Debunked. Now just before we begin, I want to quickly remind you of the official story, which is one that I accept. On September 11, 2001, four US commercial airliners were hijacked by 19 Islamic terrorists, who then proceeded to crash two of the planes into the north and south towers of the World Trade Center. Unfortunately, within hours, both towers collapsed, causing significant structural damage and fires to surrounding structures, including Building 7 which also subsequently collapsed. The third plane was crashed into the United States Department of Defense, the Pentagon, and the fourth plane was crashed into a field in Pennsylvania, likely due to its passengers heroically overcoming the hijackers. It's one of the most traumatizing events in American history, and it's become the motherload of conspiracies. Anyhow, with that said, let's begin. Number 1. 9-11 was a pretext for the War on Terror. The Americans would not have been able to invade Iraq or Afghanistan if it wasn't for 9-11. At the heart of most 9-11 conspiracies is the accusation that the events of 9-11 were either condoned by the United States government or carried out by the government as a false flag operation, as a pretext for launching the war on terror. And one of the biggest arguments for this narrative is that without 9-11, the United States would not have been able to invade the Middle East. Now first off, it simply has to be said that even if this were the case, it would not prove the conspiracy. This is just as absurd as asserting that because the United States would not have been able to invade Japan if it wasn't for Pearl Harbor, the events of Pearl Harbor must have been an inside job. Oh, yeah, that's right, such conspiracies do exist. Furthermore, and to hit this from another angle, the United States could have easily justified the war on terror through other, cheaper, and far less riskier means. Rather than relying on the silence of hundreds, if not thousands of ordinary people, causing over $10 billion in damage, and making it look like the terrorists were from Saudi Arabia and Egypt rather than Iraq and Afghanistan, they could have, for example, simply allowed the Iraqi forces who had been shooting at their planes for over a year to actually hit a few. Number 2. None of the supposed hijackers boarded the planes. Needless to say, if this assertion is true, then the official story is false, because without hijackers you can't have hijacked planes, and without hijacked planes you can't have hijacked planes crashing into buildings. Indeed, if this assertion is true, then it's damning. But as it turns out, it's not. It's simply false. There's tons of evidence proving that the hijackers boarded those planes. For example, and to emphasize just a handful of this evidence, we have passport documentations of the hijackers entering America. Documentations of four of them attending flight schools. His attitude was so bad that one of the instructors who flew with him just said he wasn't going to fly with them anymore. So that was the end of that. 
recordings of them accidentally broadcasting from the cockpit to air traffic control. Nobody moves. Everything is okay. If you try to make any moves, the danger is and the airplane. Let's stay quiet. Phone calls from the courageous passengers. Um, I only have a minute. I'm on United 93 and it's been hijacked um, by terrorists who say they have a bomb. Just wanted to say I love you and I'm gonna miss you. And forensic remains of some of the terrorists. The hijackers existed and they did board those planes. Number three, neither jet fuel nor office fires are hot enough to melt steel. One of the most popular arguments for the assertion that Building 7 was a controlled demolition is that the melting point of steel is 2,700 degrees and that since jet fuel only burns at 1,500 degrees, it's not possible that fires could have caused the buildings to collapse, and this is especially the case for Building 7. The problem with this argument, however, is that no official body has ever asserted that any of the buildings collapsed due to melted steel. Rather, and in congruence with experts, they've asserted that much lower temperatures caused the steel to lose its structural strength, which led to imbalances and eventually total collapse. To quote retired New York Deputy Fire Chief Vincent Dunn, who's the author of the book The Collapse of Burning Buildings, A Guide to Fire Ground Safety, I have never seen melted steel in a building fire, but I've seen a lot of twisted, warped, bent and sagging steel. What happens is that steel tries to expand at both ends, but when it can no longer expand, it sags and the surrounding concrete cracks. Or, as Purgatory Ironworks puts it, This is a piece of half inch thick steel, A36, structural steel, designed for structures. This is a 250 pound anvil. Do you see how the structural steel is supporting this anvil? Okay, there. Now, in my furnace, I have an identical piece of half-inch bar of steel, just like this, and it's going to be around 1,800 degrees, just 300 more than jet fuel, when it comes out. Now, watch this. I'm going to take my pinky finger, my pinky finger, half-inch solid steel. Check it out. It's a freaking noodle. Your argument is invalid. Get over it. Find a job. Number four. Building 7 could not have collapsed due to fire. Another one of the most popular arguments for the assertion that Building 7 was a controlled demolition is the fact that at the time not a single steel frame skyscraper had ever collapsed from fires alone. Not one. Building 7 was the first, and for a long time, the only. What's more is that on June 14, 2017, London's Grenfell Tower was entirely engulfed in intense flames for over 24 hours, and yet it didn't remotely collapse. This, needless to say, ignited a resurgence of support for the assertion that Building 7 must have been brought down by a demolition. But here's the thing, Grenfell Tower was not a steel-framed building, it was concrete. And hence, comparing it to Building 7 is like saying that this glass cup won't smash when I drop it, because this plastic cup won't smash when I drop it. They may serve the same purpose, but they're not comparable in this context. Furthermore, and to lay this assertion to rest, in January 2017, a steel framed building in Iran called Plasco Building caught fire and just like Building 7, it collapsed. And hence, Building 7 is no longer the only steel framed skyscraper to collapse due to fire. Number five, Building 7 collapsed at freefall. In a nutshell, this argument asserts that because Building 7 collapsed at freefall, it therefore must have been the result of controlled demolition. I mean, sure, Plasco Building may have burnt to the ground due to fires, but it didn't collapse at freefall. Now, in my opinion, this is a convincing argument until you understand two things. The first is that Building 7, like the Twin Towers, was a tube-framed construction which means that most of its support beams were on the perimeter to allow for more open floor space. And the second is that most conspiracy videos disingenuously only show the free fall part of the collapse and not the eight seconds beforehand. The reason for this, in my opinion, is because with the addition of the eight seconds, the videos reflect exactly what NIST concluded. An internal failure caused the building's internal structure to collapse vertically and then from east to west, which then left the hollowed out exoskeleton to collapse at freefall under its own weight. 
It looks like a demolition. I agree, but it's not. Now, if you're interested in a much more in-depth refusion of this assertion, then you can find in the description a link to a video created by Edward Curran. It's very informative, excellently executed, and absolutely worth checking out. Number 6. The BBC prematurely reported the collapse of Building 7. Okay, the BBC reported that this Building 7 collapsed a full 15 minutes or so before it actually did. The proponents of this argument assert that the only way that the BBC could have reported the premature collapse of Building 7 is if they were part of the conspiracy, is if they already knew that it was going to come down before it did. The problem, however, is that news networks make mistakes like this all the time. For example, shortly after the Boston Marathon bombings, several news networks prematurely reported that an arrest had been made. Now, does this mean that the news networks were in on a Boston Marathon conspiracy? Of course not. They're human and they made a pretty big mistake. Furthermore, as someone who's worked in advertising, I can tell you that news networks succeed by having provocative titles, clickbait images, and by publishing information before their competition. And so they're naturally prone to make mistakes and to report things prematurely. Couple this with the fact that the events of 9-11 were extremely chaotic and confusing and that tons of people, including firefighters, were explicitly stating that the building was bulging and that it was going to collapse. It's easy to understand such a mistake. See what a white smoke is? You see this thing leaning like this? It's definitely going to There's no way to stop it. Because you have to go up in there to put it out, and it's already... The, the, the structural integrity is not there in the building. Number seven. No Jews were killed in the attacks because they were forewarned. Now, this assertion originated in the Middle East almost immediately after the attacks, but it didn't receive worldwide attention until August 2010, when the Iranian president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, publicly stated that no Zionists were killed in the attacks since one day earlier they were told not to go to their workplace, and that the attack deliberately created and prepared public opinion so that everyone considered an attack on Afghanistan and Iraq. Now again, if this assertion is true, then it's extremely suspicious. But, again, it's not. And because of this, it's one of the most contemptible and outright insulting conspiracy theories I've ever heard. In actuality, the number of Jews who died within the attacks is estimated to be between 270 and 400, a number that closely reflects the percentage of Jews working in the area at that time. This assertion is simply a despicable lie. Anyhow, for the next two arguments, I've got a guest who knows a great deal about 9-11. Here's Secular TJ. First and foremost, thanks for having me on your phenomenal channel, Stephen. Let me introduce myself to your audience. I am TJ from the YouTube channel Secular TJ, who embarrassingly used to believe the claims made by the 9-11 truth movement. I have produced two videos debunking Truther's most compelling claims, which at my dismay, persuaded me to believe the theories. You can check the videos out after watching this video, all links will be in the description area below. Since I have covered the controlled demolition claims in one video, I will address the particular deceptive methods used by the truth movement in an effort to expose the dishonesty, misdirection, and outright propagandistic tactics used by the truth movement. Quote mining is a common tactic used by the truth movement. Quote mining is a term used to describe people who dig up any quote which may support their case while leaving out quotes which hurt it. As we can see, quote mining is similar to confirmation bias, which is the cognitive bias of seeking out confirming evidence while leaving out disconfirming evidence. Here's an example of truthers quote mining firefighters. Quote, when we got about 50 feet from the South Tower, we heard the most eerie sound that you would ever hear. A high-pitched noise and a popping noise made everyone stop. We all looked up at the point it all let go. There was an explosion and the whole top leaned toward us and started coming down. It is clearly stated that the popping sounds were the result of rivets popping and not bombs. If a large boat would snap, logically it should result in a loud popping sound. It's not unreasonable to assume he didn't know how the building was built at the time of the interview, so he leaned towards something he knew. Interestingly, Nish said that most of the failures were at the boats 
and of other connections at the floor collapse. Explosives don't usually make a high-pitched popping noise. Fireman quotes are routinely taken out of context. The most prevalent examples are of firemen saying they heard explosions. I have little doubt they did, as an acre of concrete, steel, and office furniture should make an explosive sound when it crashes down onto another. Steel boat snapping can make an explosive sound all by themselves. A video filmed by Jules and Gideon Nade is shown on just about every conspiracy website which shown a few firemen discussing what they heard and saw. We made it outside, we made it about a block. We made it at least two blocks, two blocks. and we started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Dead, yeah, you know, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. I was watching right. it and running. In the context of reading it off a conspiracy site, this may sound like damning evidence. They are saying words like detonated, and they had planned to take down a building. They even say boom to describe the sound. But if you hear the other things they're saying, their body language and context outside of the conspiracy theory setting, something else emerges. Before or after every description is as if. As if they had planned to take down a building. It was as if, as if they had detonated. It was if, if they had detonated, that, yeah, you know, detonated. they were planned yeah. to take down a building. They also show body language to show it was the sound of the floors crashing into one another. Floor by floor, it started popping out. As he said boom and moved his hand down, this could be interpreted to account for the pancake theory. But the real evidence isn't so much examining the video as examining the actions taken or not taken by the New York City Fire Department after the event. The New York City Fire Department hasn't rallied its members to force an investigation into the possible United States government murder of over 300 of its members. Some sites offer an explanation of saying there was a gag order placed on the fire department. The only place you will find this on is conspiracy theory websites. No mention from the mainstream press about the hundreds if not thousands of firemen on the scene not being allowed to talk. It is patently absurd. The last claim made by truthers is why is there a small hole in a pentagon if a commercial airliner hit it? Two holes were visible in the pentagon immediately after the attack. A 75 foot wide entry hole in the building's exterior wall and a 16 foot wide hole in ring C, the pentagon's middle ring. So how does a plane 120 feet wide fit into a 16 foot hole? According to popular mechanics, when American Airlines Flight 77 hit the Pentagon's exterior wall, Ring E, it created a hole approximately 70 feet wide, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, Pentagon Building Performance Report. The exterior facade collapsed about 20 minutes after impact. Uh, not identified by name, but identified as being uh, dead, and uh, there are a number of casualties, but uh, we're, the FBI has secured the site and the um But ASCE based its measurements of the original hole on the number of first floor support columns that were destroyed or damaged. Computer simulations confirmed the findings. Why wasn't the hole as wide as the 757's 120 foot 10 inch wingspan? A crashing jet doesn't punch a cartoon-like outline of itself into a reinforced concrete building, rendering this baseless assertion patently absurd. The tidy hole in Ring C was 12 foot wide, not 16 foot. ASCE concludes it was made by the jet's landing gear, not by the fuselage. Cheers TJ, I really appreciate it. Anyhow, to recap, in my opinion, 9-11 conspiracy theories are the manifestation of massive trauma, frustration, confirmation bias, scientific illiteracy, deliberate deception, and laziness. Look, don't get me wrong, I don't trust the United States government, and I recognize that the war on terror was largely a failure. But, to paraphrase Sam Harris, I'm simply not convinced that a government that couldn't hide a semen stained dress somehow orchestrated the most profound and complicated conspiracy of all time. A conspiracy that necessarily included the participation of hundreds, if not thousands of ordinary people. 
people in the military, emergency services, local citizens and family members of those who died, just to justify a war in Iraq and Afghanistan, not Saudi Arabia and Egypt, which is where the hijackers were from, when there were far easier and way less riskier ways to achieve this. The conspiracy is just not plausible, and the evidence is simply not there. Anyhow, for more on this topic, be sure to check out Secular TJ's wonderful content. And as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my awesome patrons. And on that note, this month's patron of the month is Michaela Isom. You've won Free Will by Sam Harris. Congrats, and I hope you've enjoyed the read. Anyhow, I'm going to leave you with a highly relevant clip from a fantastic YouTuber called Captain Disillusioned, who, if you haven't checked out, you really ought to. Enjoy. Listen to me. The power to tell real from fake doesn't come from being a world expert or mistrusting every single thing you see. It comes from an honest willingness to change your opinions and beliefs based on new facts. So learn to enjoy being wrong. The world might start making more sense. You won't feel quite as out of step with the rest of humanity. Your words won't cause needless pain to people who suffered real tragedies. And the words of others won't sway you into believing myths over truth. You'll be able to love with your heart but use your head for everything else.